Next up, we have the pleasure of hearing from Neil Doshi, uh, who's at Harvard. Whoops. Uh, there we go. Cool. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys today about contact and close trajectory optimization of locomotion trajectories for a quadrupedal micro robot. So, the robot in question is the Harvard Ambulatory Micro Robot, or HAMMER for short. This is a 1.5 gram quadruped you see over here, made using laminate manufacturing techniques. Uh, one of the cool things about HAMMER is that Despite its small size, it has eight actuated degrees of freedom. We have four degrees of freedom that control the height of the leg, we call them lift, and then four that control the leg's four aft motion, or the swing. And um, so, uh, this robot's able to do a bunch of cool stuff, like high speed locomotion like you see here, or trajectory following with its eight actuated degrees of freedom. However, a lot of these results, and I've worked on them, uh, have been sort of produced through exhaustive experimental testing. So these take off in hundreds or thousands of trials in like weeks and weeks of time. And so what I want to talk about today is a model-based approach to augment these experimental ideas. Um, and so we frame this sort of locomotion planning as a trajectory optimization where you're minimizing some cost function with respect to the robot and contact dynamics. Um, and in particular, what we do here is we develop a really high fidelity model of the robot and do all the computationally heavy stuff offline and sort of the pre-processing step. And then these uh, high fidelity models give us pretty accurate locomotion plans that we can track with simple controllers online that makes sense because we're a small micro robot and you know, we're computationally constrained. Um, talking about the modeling, here's one of the four transmissions on the robot. As you can see, it's a pretty complicated uh, mechanical system. There's two actuators here, and they're sort of coupled through this linkage system to the leg. There's actually 11 flexures in this transmission and three parallel kinematic chains. Um, we model these flexures using the pseudo rigid body model, and given that approximation, we actually have 76 states for the whole robot and 24 uh, kinematic position constraints. So this is a pretty gnarly robot. Uh, in addition, because of all the elastic elements in here, we actually have these 100 hertz sort of passive dynamics where the natural frequency of these transmissions are at 100 hertz. So we actually have to sample faster than that. So like you'd have to sort of do 200 hertz sampling on your trajectory optimization or whatever in order to resolve your dynamics. Um, so what we do is, uh, sorry, for the contact, I uh, use sort of complementarity formulation of contact, which I think a lot of you guys might be familiar with. And then to put it all together as an optimization, we use this recent uh, variational integrator. And the idea behind here is you can sort of do higher order discretizations of both the robot and the contact dynamics than the first order uh, that sort of Struten Trinkle did a while back. And that gives you sort of higher accuracy for the same problem size, which is really important because we're already kind of have these big problems with the big robot and this high frequency sample. Um, and so now that we have this pipeline putting it all together, we pre compute a bunch of these trajectories. We optimize nine periodic gates at uh, three different frequencies, 2, 10, and 30 hertz. And these frequencies are meant to sort of uh, represent different modes for the robot. Two is the before any of the body dynamics. 10 is at the Z natural frequency, and 30 is at the roll natural frequency. And then we do these optimizations over three different surfaces, Teflon, cardstock, and sandpaper. So it's a wide variety of friction conditions from Teflon, which is super slippery, to cardstock, which is like pretty sticky. And then we ask the robot to move about 10 millimeters per cycle, which I know doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually about the maximum theoretical stride length for this robot, so it's pretty fast. And then finally, we also use this to plan a vertical jump about one body height. Um, so we evaluate all of these on the robot, this little guy here, in this uh, locomotion arena. Uh, we use um, Vicon cameras, and actually I had to develop a little estimator um, because the latency on the Vicon is a little too much. So I fuse it with some sensors to get sort of these low latency estimates of the leg and body positions. And then the tracking is simply done using simple PD controllers that are just tracking the leg position in the body frame. Um, I know it's like the tiniest bike on right um, And so here are the results. At 2 hertz, um, the model actually captures a lot of the robot's sort of salient dynamic properties. As you can see, um, the experiments match the model very well. And this is sort of, even though we're only controlling the light trajectories, and you can see in all three surfaces, the robot's able to move about 10 millimeters per cycle. Um, sort of over the range of trajectories, um, these uh, optimized experiments in blue move about 17% faster than trajectories I hand-tuned. Um, the average velocity for the 2 and 10 hertz gates is about uh, 9.2 millimeters per cycle, which is comparable to the fastest velocity we had previously measured, about 9.5. We actually get the fastest sort of per cycle velocity on this robot ever, about 11 millimeters per cycle at 10 hertz here. And then even these 30 hertz gates, which are kind of slower and not as good, um, perform 30% faster than similar laterally, uh, other laterally asymmetric gates. Um, finally, um, we just sort of wanted to show that we maintain gate timing across all of these except for some of the 30 hertz, and we're actually able to track the electric trajectories in the body frame fairly well. And then lastly, here's a vertical jump, where we get about the same jump height, but we're not explicitly controlling sort of floating base posts, so it rolls and pitches a little more than we'd want because it's sensitive to how it leaves the ground. 
So in conclusion, we sort of, I use this framework to generate accurate whole body locomotion plans. And then I validated it on this micro robot with simple controllers and it actually yielded performance improvements. And this is, I think, a cool alternative to, on, to online planning and control for computationally constrained systems. Because obviously we can't do something like MPC on this robot. Uh, so thank my co-authors and collaborators and questions. Any questions? Got about a minute. Well, selfishly, again, are you, uh, are you aware of, and if so, uh, how would you compare your results to the like, stratified geometric motion planning work of Joel Burdick in like the 90s for little like robots that look very much like this? this okay, I was not aware of that. That's cool. You might want to check it out. Cool. Yeah, That'd absolutely. be an interesting Thank comparison. You. Yeah. you mentioned the natural frequency. I wonder, has there been any, been any thought or direction towards designing the natural frequency to uh, be congruent with the operating frequency to take advantage maybe of resonances and harmonics? Yes. Uh, I think one of the original sort of inspirations behind this was to run a resonance, because we actually are kind of pretty limited in terms of stride length, but you can obviously get a ton of stride length at resonance. But uh, controlling the motion of the robot at resonance is difficult. And I think accurately designing models that capture that resonant behavior is also difficult. So a lot of the stuff I showed you was sort of well under the transmission resonance. I don't think the modeling is quite there yet, because there's some other stuff that yeah, we need to be looked at. Okay, great. We're out of time. All right, I'll get to you next time. I see you now. One more, one more round of applause, please. Okay.